Okay, I've gotten the okay to start. So hello all, my name is Chris Phelan and I'm currently the chair of the Department of Economics here at the University of Minnesota. On behalf of the entire department and the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Minnesota, I wanna welcome you, unfortunately virtually this year, to the Department of Economics John Goldstein Memorial Lecture on Economics and Environmental Policy. This annual event honors the legacy of one of our distinguished PhD alums, John Heller Goldstein. The department is very thankful to another distinguished PhD alumnus, Richard Sandor, and his wife, Ellen Sandor, for their gen generosity in making this lecture series possible. I'd especially like to welcome, again virtually, unfortunately, Richard and Ellen, John's wife, Ann Patterson, daughter, Julia, and their extended family and friends to this lecture today. I know that John held Professor Stavins in high regard. John Goldstein devoted 35 years to public service as an economist working tirelessly to improve the environment and reduce po poverty through investment in human capital. In 1964, Dr. Goldstein earned his PhD in economics from the University of Minnesota and went on to play several key roles in the Social Security Administration the Department of Interior, and on the Endangered Species Committee. Dr. Goldstein's distinguished career with the Department of the Interior, his seminal work on wetlands conservation, and numerous articles on the impact of federal programs on wetlands will leave a lasting legacy on environmental policy. To introduce today's speaker, Professor Robert Staff Stavins of Harvard University, and to moderate our program, I am happy to welcome my friend, co-author, and colleague, Professor V.V. Chari. Thanks, Chris. Let me add my welcome to Chris's. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have all of you here uh, in these strange times dominated by plague and politics. Um, the, we're honored to have Professor Robert Stevens uh, give this year's John Goldstein Memorial Lecture. Uh, professor Stevens is uh, the A.J. Mayer Professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard. Uh, Rob is a distinguished uh, environmental economist uh, who received his PhD in economics from Harvard uh, a little while ago, I think, uh, and combines within him three attributes which is very uncommon to see joined in a single person. Uh, he has first, he is a well-known academic economist who has made significant and important disciplines to economics as a science. One illustration of the important work he has done is to re-emphasize the importance of incentives in economic behavior. One of his well-known papers uh, shows very convincingly that increases in energy prices lead to uh, a fairly extensive amount of technological innovation in the air conditioning industry, um, which I think is heartening for all of those, all of us who believe that incentives are important. Second, uh, he has um, used his professional knowledge, expertise, and abilities to guide and inform policy in a variety of ways. He's been lead author on all the reports of the International Panel on, on Climate Change, particularly focusing on the economics uh, of climate change and uh, helping guide that discussion uh, in a useful and productive uh, direction. Third, he has been a prolific commentator who has communicated to the general public uh, the insights that economics can bring to studying the environment and in particular climate change more recently. Uh, not only that, he's also had a very colorful co career. He was a Peace Corps volunteer in his youth. And uh, most important, I think from my perspective, he was one of the, I believe one of the founding members of the Association of Wine Economists, uh, an endeavor that Orly Ashenfelter uh, led. Uh, and I think that in this time of plague and politics, even if it's the middle of the day, I think we should uh, listen to uh, 
uh, Professor Stevens with a glass of 2018 Montrachet uh, next to us or any other wine that he would uh, recommend. So uh, having said all that, let me welcome Rob Stevens, who will give this year's uh, uh, Goldstein lecture. Before I do that, mechanics. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A bar. Uh, please uh, click on that uh, and type in questions you might have. I think there's also a like button, which will uh, enable us to see uh, which questions have the most widespread support. And then uh, uh, Professor Stevens will talk for about a half an hour or so. And then I'll come back and try and ask as many of your questions uh, as I can, and then Professor Goldstein will answer. Uh, and so we'll run for about an hour or so. Uh, with all that, Rob, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Chari, and thank you, Chris, as well. Um, I'm really delighted to be with all of you today, and I'm quite honored to present the John Goldstein Memorial Lecture. Um, and I don't say that lightly, I say it for several reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that the list of previous presenters includes people whom I know very well and for whom I have great respect. Uh, furthermore, I understand and recognize that this year's presenter was originally intended to be my late Harvard colleague and good friend, Marty Weitzman, whom I miss greatly. So it's particularly touching to be with you. But another reason that makes this special for me is that the fund for this lecture series was established by Richard and Ellen Sandor. And if you don't know it, I will tell you that the name of Richard Sandor is legendary among those of us who have worked on the design of environmental markets for the past 30 years. Finally, there's the very name of the lecture series itself, the John Goldstein Memorial Lectures. Uh, I knew John and worked with him rather closely in the late 1980s when I was a new assistant professor at the Harvard Kennedy School and he was the senior economist at the US Department of the Interior. It so happens that my PhD thesis in economics at Harvard in 1988 was on the depletion of forested wetlands, a topic of great interest and expertise for John. So John somehow found out about my thesis, he contacted me, and then over the subsequent years, we met regularly when I was Washington, in Washington, because I was working closely uh, with the George H.W. Bush White House on what turned out to be the Clean Air Act amendments, the cap and trade system of 1990. And so during that period of time, I invited John to a whole series of conferences at Harvard, uh, meetings at the White House, meetings at Congress, and he was truly a wonderful colleague. So that, more than anything, makes this very special for me. Um, finally, I just want to thank, of course, it goes without saying, the University of Minnesota and its Department of Economics. So with that, let me turn to the topic of my presentation today, and for that I'm going to uh, share my screen with you because I'm going to use some slides. So as you can see, or as you may already have known, um, my topic, whoops, sorry. Uh, my topic is what can an economist possibly have to say about climate change policy? Now to the economists in the audience, that's a question that doesn't have to be asked. But for the other 99.9% .9 of the people in the world, that's quite a meaningful question because it's not necessarily clear. So therefore, I'm going to start by trying to describe what I believe is the value of an economic perspective when thinking about climate change policy. And I'll start with the value of an economic perspective even more broadly, just for environmental policy of any kind. And there are two reasons for this value. One is that the causes of environmental problems in a market economy, such as we have in this country and all but a handful of countries in the world now are economic. Um, environmental problems are essentially the unintended side effects of 
meritorious activities carried out by producers when they're producing the goods and services that you and I want, and sometimes are the unintended side effects of consumers' activities when we're using those goods and services. And that's what economists refer to as externalities. The other reason for the claim of value on my part is that the consequences of environmental problems have very important economic dimensions. So surely if the causes of these problems are economic and the causes have economic dimensions, then an economic perspective can be very helpful. In fact, I would go further and I would say it's essential for a full understanding of environmental problems. But you know, I sit in the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, not in the Department of Economics. And so I'm not interested today in understanding just for the sake of understanding, as wonderful as that may be, but rather because a full understanding can be extremely helpful for the design of solutions, policy solutions that will be effective, by which I mean they'll actually reduce pollutant emissions as opposed to, for example, simply demonizing the bad guys, that they'll econo be economically sensible, by which I mean that we do not unnecessarily and systematically shoot ourselves in the foot by spending more than we want to on environmental protection. After all, we don't only care about environmental protection, we care about the quality and quantity of healthcare, education, the price of food, the price of fuel, on and on. And that finally, because of this, they might be more likely to be politically pragmatic. Now, this kind of economic thinking, it turns out, is particularly important for the formulation of effective, sensible, and politically feasible climate change policies. And I say this for two quite specific reasons. One has to do with the spatial nature of the problem of climate change, and the other with the intertemporal nature of the problem. And in both cases, we start with the science, go to the economics, and it leads us to the geopolitics. So starting with the spatial, greenhouse gases mix in the atmosphere. So that means that the location of emissions has no effect whatsoever on impacts. It doesn't matter if a ton of carbon dioxide or another greenhouse gas comes from New York or from New Delhi, it has the same impacts. In economic terms, climate change is a global commons problem. That turns out to be quite important economically because it means that any jurisdiction that takes action incurs the costs of its actions, essentially the costs of going from coal to petroleum to natural gas to renewables and possibly nuclear for electricity generation, greater energy efficiency across the board, uh, different sorts of fuels for motor vehicles and the like. So the jurisdiction, whether it's a country such as the US or Korea, it's a state such as California or a region such as the European Union incurs the cost of its actions, but the climate benefits are distributed, distributed globally. And surely the basic arithmetic of that is then going to tell us that for virtually any jurisdiction, the direct climate benefits it reaps from its actions will be less than the cost that it incurs. Despite the fact that the global benefits may be greater, indeed much greater than the global or even the local costs of its actions. This presents a classic free rider problem, which is why international, if not fully global, as I'll explain, cooperation is essential and it's why national policies rather than subnational policies are preferable. Now remember, there's also a temporal dimension of the problem scientifically that takes us again from science to economics to politics and policy. And that is the greenhouse gases accumulate in the atmosphere. The half-life of carbon dioxide, for example, is on the order more than a hundred years. And the damages, the degree of climate change is a function of the concentrations in the atmosphere, the stock, not the flow at a moment in time. Indeed, if CO2 emissions were to begin falling tomorrow by 5% per year and to continue falling at that rate, which would be very significant, the rate of warming would not begin to change in a way that was detectable until after 20 years. 
So the greatest benefits of climate policies will be in the long term. But those climate change policies and the intended costs of mitigation of those policies, those are upfront when the policies are instituted. This combination of upfront cost and delayed benefits presents a massive political challenge. Because remember, the political incentive in representative democracies is to give benefits to today's generation, i.e. today's voters, and to place the costs on future generations. And we have uh, abundant examples of that happening, in fact. The climate problem is asking politicians to do precisely the opposite, which is why a member of the U.S. Senate for, with whom I've worked for decades um, always liked to say that climate change, of all the problems he thought about across the board, not just environment, was the most difficult political challenge for the two reasons that I have laid out. So together, the global commons nature of the problem and this intertemporal asymmetry make it not only a very tough political challenge, but they also suggest why economics can help with the design of better public policies. Now, policy analysts, and not just economists, but a much broader set of policy analysts in most parts of the world tend to favor carbon pricing. So first, let me say, what do I mean by carbon pricing? Well, there are two major approaches. One is a carbon tax and one is emissions trading. So a carbon tax or a levy, if you don't want to use the T word, would be a tax on the carbon content of fossil fuels, not on CO2 emissions per se, too many sources to monitor, but on the, car on the carbon content of the three fossil fuels, coal, petroleum, and natural gas. And then that revenue from the tax can be used for a variety of purposes, including the economist's favorite of reducing distortionary taxes, making a revenue neutral policy, the revenue can also be used to compensate burdened policies, burdened parties, whether that's specific sectors of the economy or specific sectors of the geography, and could also be used, for example, to fund R&D. With the carbon tax, the good news is that the compliance cost is certain. On the other hand, the quantity of resulting emissions is uncertain, although we can certainly estimate it. The other major approach, a emissions trading system, the type that I'm thinking of is what is referred to as cap and trade. And in this case, the government allocates allowances, permits for the carbon content of fossil fuels, again, not emissions. And again, at the point at which they enter the economy, the mine mouth, the wellhead, the point of import. This allocation can be by a free distribution or they can be sold by auction. If they're auctioned, then the revenues can be used for the same set of purposes I just mentioned in regard to a carbon tax. In any event, the important thing is that trading is allowed. And the result is, is that those who can control emissions at lower cost have an incentive to take on more of the burden. Those for whom it's very costly take on less of the burden. That's the same thing that happens with a carbon tax. And in this case, it's the supply and demand for the allowances that generates a price. The quantity generates a price rather than the price generating a quantity. And here, the quantity, of course, is set. So that's good news to some, but the compliance cost then is going to be uncertain. Now, these approaches, and I'll just take them in general as carbon pricing, are highly favored by policy analysts. So as I said. So now let me address the question of why. And it's not for ideological reasons. It's not because economists or others like the market. It's rather for very pragmatic reasons. The first is no other feasible approach can provide a me meaningful emissions reduction. So if we're talking about net zero by 2050, or even the target that was talked about just a few years ago was an 80% reduction by 2050. It's inconceivable that that could be done through conventional approaches because we're not just talking about putting in place a performance standard or a technology standards for power plants. It would be all manufacturers, all commercial facilities, all residences, all motor vehicles, all backyard barbecue grills and lawnmowers. It's inconceivable. And that's why I say the first reason that carbon pricing is favored so much by analysts is free feasibility. The second reason is, is economic. 
that because the cost of abatement vary tremendously across sources by a factor of 10,000 to one, that the least costly approach in the short run is gonna be one that equates these marginal abatement costs, if you will, across all sources. So it's the least costly approach. In the language of economics, it'll be cost effective. Also, the third reason has to do with the long-term. So if the kind of targets that are discussed politically and certainly by natural scientists were to be achieved, a tremendous amount of technological change would be required. And I don't mean simply diffusion of existing technologies. I mean invention of new ones and commercialization of those, i.e. innovation of technologies to push the economies in a more carbon-friendly direction carbon pricing can provide those long-term price signals to induce that kind of technological change. Now, for those reasons, even narrow-minded neoclassical economists like myself would at most claim that carbon pricing is necessary. We would not claim that it is sufficient. And why is that? It's because there are some other market failures in addition to the environmental externality market failure that are present, there are principal agent problems, for example, that are associated with energy efficiency investments in render occupied buildings. And in q and I'm happy to talk about any of these. And then even more important is the public good nature of information spillovers. That means even with the perfect carbon pricing, that there would be an inefficient amount, an insufficient amount of basic R&D. And so additional policies, in that case, technology policies, could be wise to try to put in place. Now, what's the worldwide status of carbon pricing? So there are major emissions trading regimes in place and announced in Europe, New Zealand, the Northeast United States, California, Korea, and in 2020, by the end of this year, the Chinese have said, and I was just in meetings in virtually in Beijing uh, last week, uh, and they still say it'll happen in 2020, a very large system which will dwarf the European system, in fact. But there are also carbon taxes and related energy taxes in many parts of the world. I'm going to quantify these on the next slide. I don't put numbers here because many of these are broader energy taxes, and so it's hard to tease out to which to what degree their CO2 taxes. And also many of these countries provide exemptions for industries that are particularly concerned about protecting. But it's important to recognize that other jurisdictions, in fact, most jurisdictions around the world won't employ carbon pricing at all, but will use a non-cost effective approach. But there's still a shadow price on carbon. It doesn't mean it's free, it's, it's just as costly. In fact, it's more costly because they're not cost effective but it's less obvious analysis is required. So let's take a look uh, at some numbers with regards to carbon prices and emissions coverage. So what I've done is that on the horizontal axis, what we're looking at is the scope that's covered in various policies around the world uh, in carbon pricing policies in terms of uh, millions of tons of emissions. And then on the vertical axis, we have the carbon price, which would either be the level of the tax or the allowance price generated by the market in a cap and trade system. And then I've placed in blue the carbon taxes and in green the existing cap and trade systems. So what should we note from this? Well, the first thing is that there are some carbon taxes in Sweden here, as you can see, is an outlier that are at much higher levels than cap and trade allowance prices. And that's certainly the case. If we wanted to ask the question, which I find interesting, of what right now is most important? I'm not making a judgment on the merits. What right now is more important in the world? Well, I think we'd want to multiply the stringency, by the, uh, which is represented by the carbon price, by the scope of action, of coverage. And in other words, what's the area of these various rectangles? So if you do this, you'll see there's a lot more green than blue which is why it's easy to see that as of now, um, right, that uh, cap and trade systems are more important in the world in ter than carbon taxes. Now, importantly though, remember this only adds up to about 15% of CO2 equivalent emissions. CO2 equivalent, I mean CO2 plus the other greenhouse gases, but in CO2 terms in, in regard to radiative forcing. Uh, 
Importantly, China accounts for about 30% of global CO2 emissions. They're now the world's largest emitters since 2006, when they surpassed the United States. China's emissions trading system, which is actually not cap and trade per se, um, that is pledged to come in uh, to implementation by the end of this year. They say eventually, not immediately, eventually they'll cover half of their emissions. So that means that it would cover 15% of global emissions. So the China system, if it eventually does that, would push out this graph all the way to the right side of the page and there would be another area of green at approximately the same price by current uh, forecasts. Um, bringing it out here. So those are the, that's the basic status of carbon pricing. Now I wanna turn and ask, well, what are the consequences of carbon pricing? And starting with the fossil fuels. So the greatest impacts globally are on coal due to the high carbon content of coal. This is principally for electricity generation. There are immediate impacts on electricity dispatch. There are long-term impacts on the uh, investment of new capacity. Um, that is delaying it, and long-term impacts on earlier retirement of existing capacity. That's all in theory. Uh, natural gas, there are much smaller impacts because of the much lower carbon content of natural gas compared to coal. And there could actually, a carbon price could inspire an increase in uh, natural gas use in the short term because of substitution for coal. This is, would particularly be the case in the, in the United States. But we should emphasize that the likely effects of carbon pricing at the levels that they're frequently talked about would be relatively small in this regard in US electricity generation compared with what the effects have already been of two technologies with just the market itself, horizontal drilling and hydraulic frac fracturing combined essentially referred to as fracking, which have opened up unconventional sources of natural gas and oil and have therefore lowered the price. And we've seen tremendous substitution from coal to natural gas in the US for electricity. For oil, uh, the potentially significant impacts may be muted, at least in the short term, because there are limited substitutes for, for liquid fuels in the transportation sector. In other words, the marginal cost of CO2 emissions reductions, uh, the marginal abatement cost is higher in this sector than in the electricity uh, generation sector. So a cost-effective portfolio, if you weren't using carbon pricing, but were targeting specific industries, in the short term, it wouldn't target oil. But there will be effects on the oil markets, but largely through suppressed demand due to increased uh, energy efficiency. And then in the long run, uh, seeing substitutes uh, essentially for electric vehicles, assuming that the source of electricity uh, for, the electric, for the electricity is itself a renewable. So speaking of uh, renewables, I've emphasized that carbon pricing would be bad news for coal, holding else, everything else constant, even in the short term, mixed for natural gas, and probably muted for oil in the short ter term. But very good news for renewables, wind and solar as well as others, and possibly for nuclear, but there are political issues there in terms of siting. Interestingly, in other sectors, climate policies increase costs. So there's a simple rule of thumb. Uh, they're bad news for sectors that use energy. But that's all sectors. But it's actually, you have to go a little deeper because carbon pricing, that is increasing energy costs, can be very good news for producers of energy consuming durable goods. Take Boeing aircraft or Airbus as examples, because the reason that commercial airlines buy the new generation of aircraft is not because they want blue lights in the ceiling instead of white lights, it's because they're cheaper to operate because jet fuel is their principal variable cost that leads them to be in the black or the red from year to year. So we have a more rapid turnover of a capital stock in aviation, when jet fuel prices go up, great news for producers of energy consuming durable goods. But that also tells us they're particularly bad news for some of those consumers of those same energy consuming dur durable goods, United Airlines, Lufthansa, or whatever. 
And indeed, it's interesting if you look at who supports in uh, different industries, different companies who have in the past supported climate ch change policy or not, or have been silent or opposed it, putting aside for obvious reasons, the fossil fuel industry, which is always resistant, a lot of it is explained by this. So US CAP, which was an uh, industry consortium trying to put in place a cap and trade system and other climate policies in the Obama administration was led by General Electric, a producer of energy consuming durable goods. Who else was in there? Well, Caterpillar, uh, the automobile companies, but who was not in there? Well, United Airlines, the consumers. So uh, again, when, when I look at the positions of many companies on climate change policies, I tend not to judge them in terms of a basis of values of that their ethics are good or bad or match mine or don't, they're usually operating in their own economic interest or at least their judgment of their own economic interest. So there's a reminder I should uh, offer at the very end here, and that is this is a global commons problem. So international cooperation is necessary. I'm going to mention just very briefly the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, the good news is that it was a landmark climate accord. It was a dramatic departure from the structure of the previous 20 years, of which I had been critical. Uh, it provides a broad foundation for meaningful future progress due to, I'll show you, its expanded uh, scope. And so it could turn out to be a key step forward. But whether the agreement is truly successful is not going to be known for decades. Anyone who comes to you and says the Paris Climate Agreement is going to succeed, that they're talking about their hopes. Anyone who says it's going to fail, they're talking about their priors, not from analysis. Because the Paris Agreement does provide an opportunity because there are two necessary conditions for ultimate success. One is adequate scope of participation. The Paris Agreement has taken us from 14%, one four under the Kyoto Protocol, the European Union plus New Zealand to 97% uh, under the Paris Agreement. The United States, as you may know, dropped out officially of the Paris Agreement uh, just yesterday. That drops that 97% to 85%, which is still a lot better than the 14%. But the other key necessary condition is adequate ambition of policies and of course successful implementation. And what that means is that it's really up to the individual uh, countries, the 187 parties to the Paris Agreement. And we can talk more about that, including about uh, this country if you like afterwards. So, but thinking beyond Paris, final words, uh, they, the talks were a success in my judgment. Uh, but we're not going to know the success of the agreement itself for many years. Uh, international cooperation is essential because it's a global commons problem, but the key action will be at the national levels. And the Paris Agreement provides an opportunity for a new path forward. We've met one of the two necessary conditions. The second one we're still waiting on. But you have to remember the Paris Agreement, the numbers in there were just the first five years. Um, every five years, the countries renew their sort of their targets. Uh, but even this first set of targets was quite striking um, that if everyone was in, including the US, then the effect would be to bring down what would be business as usual, five to seven degrees centigrade warming to three and a half degrees centigrade. The Montreal Protocol on stratospheric ozone depletion, recent changes bring it down another half a degree. So that's three degrees C that's much higher than the two degrees C or the one and a half degrees C that are now political targets. But this is the first five years. And it's, so I would say it's certainly a step in the right direction. Um, in the years to come, the major locus of international cooperation may continue to be the UNFCCC, or it may be others that we can talk about. But under any of these venues for international cooperation, whether it's the UN or some other one, the importance of carbon pricing and, I will argue, uh, economic thinking uh, are going to remain. So I, I went through a lot, particularly if this is new to you. Um, you can get more information from the Harvard Project on Climate Agreements, which I direct, the Environmental Economics Program, which is uh, 30 faculty members across the university. I have the pleasure of directing that. My website, my blog, 
or you can follow me on, on Twitter. But I warn you, if you follow me on Twitter today, although some of my commentary is on the Paris Agreement withdrawal yesterday, much will be on the current election and the various controversies thereof. So with that, I will say uh, thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Rob. That was uh, exceptionally informative and very interesting. Let me kick it off um, before we, uh, before you get a chance to answer questions from the audience at large with a question that I think is, a, is at the heart of your talk. Uh, you eloquently made the case that most policy analysts and essentially all economists uh, like the idea of putting a price either through a tax or through uh, a market system uh, on, on, on carbon. Um, but there are a number of people, I think, out there, a number of influential people, um, including proponents of the so-called Green New Deal and so on, who think that a different way to go is better, and that involves essentially direct regulation. So we will mandate that every car be electric. We will mandate that every house have the right kind of energy efficient roof and so on and so forth. That's the only practical way of doing things, relying on a, a market system to achieve these goals is self-defeating because the, the, the market just won't work for all of these things. Uh, I, I think it's important for us to try and, uh, and argue. You, you in part said it was not feasible and I think their attitude is, oh, sure, it's feasible. We just pass a law and we enforce it and we send the cops out. So what would, what would your argument be to people who think that, that uh, a better approach is, and, and by the way, that's the approach that, that the United States certainly and many countries have followed, which is a, an approach of direct regulation and direct intervention. So direct regulation, um, such as a uniform performance standard or a, a standard that mandates particular technologies be adopted, are feasible. They're not cost effective, but they're feasible for a lot of environmental problems, including the requirement that there's a catalytic converter on your car and my car. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're feasible in the case of climate change because of the fact we're, not talking, we're now talking about very disparate set of sources and it's absolutely impossible to specify technologies that would affect all of those sources. So I said, it's not just electricity generation uh, sector, it's all of manufacturing, it's all of commercial, it's every residence, it's every motor vehicle, it's every airplane on and on. So what's essential is affecting the price of the fossil fuels. The reason that it's so effective in this case, and this you know, may, may sound more like rhetoric, but, you know, it's Adam Smith. I mean, that's what, an, that's what an economy does. It sends information about relative scarcity. I don't need to say this to, to you or any of the economists, of course. And that's why it's feasible. However, I would agree that in the short term, it could well be that for political reasons, carbon pricing is not feasible. Um, for example, the situation that we're now facing in the United States for the next four years, even if Mr. Biden is elected president, Republicans, if they do maintain control of the Senate, which we will only know on January 5th, um, if they do, then it, it's, it's probably virtually impossible to put in place a carbon price of any meaningful magnitude, either a tax or a cap and trade. Remember, that was impossible in the Obama administration when Democrats controlled both houses of Congress. We still couldn't do it. So in that context then, I would wanna to turn to second best instruments, sometimes that economists are not eager to do. Um, a more eager in the Journal of Economic Perspectives than in the Journal of Economic Theory, perhaps. And those second best instruments, then we can apply our economic training to design those to be a, as good as possible, make them a little less costly than otherwise. And I could, if I wasn't taking more time, I could give examples uh, of those. So I'm actually engaged in re research right now with a uh, friend, former student, Billy Pizer at Duke University, in which we're looking at policy instruments in terms of their deterministic uh, 
net present value for different policy instruments, and then multiplying that through expert solicitation of views from staff in the Congress by probability of implementation. Because, and then you get the expected net present value of the instrument, and that leads you to a different set of instruments, not to the ideal ones. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, I was I actually, while you were talking, um, I, I did want to suggest one po possible answer to my, or partial answer to my own question, which is related to your career and your accomplishments. So um, uh, we tried direct regulation and in, with the environment, in, with the initial Clean Air Act, and uh, pretty soon, we'll talk about the details of how it was linked. We had a severe problem with acid rain. With the Clean Air Act amendments, we introduced markets. Mm -hmm. And those markets worked so marvelously well that, um, you know, as we, don't, we don't talk about acid rain anymore right. as a serious economic issue. So I think economists have and you in particular have, have contributed a lot to this specific thing, have a lot to be proud of in terms of using markets and economic tools to address social problems. Uh, but let, let me, I think Chris may have a question, then uh, I'll, I'll turn to some of the questions from the floor. I think you're muted. Found the mute button. This question is about enforcement, internet, because you talked a lot wonderfully about the, the world tragedy of the commons issue. And, and I'm gonna end rather long question with asking you a question about whether or not in tech, whether or not we have the technology to detect cheating. So the basic idea that I think is true is that if you produce a widget in the United States, per widget, you're gonna have less carbon impact than if you produce that same widget in China. So at least one possibility that I worry about is that if we put on an effective carbon tax and they don't because of either lack of enforcement or not passing the law, then widgets that would be produced in the United States become more expensive to produce, right. less expensive to produce in China. Right. And they get produced in China. And in fact, the net impact on world carbon goes up because they're not using scrubber, you know, they're using less energy efficient technologies. Or at least it stays the same. We've yeah. incurred costs on the United States, lost competitiveness and done nothing for the environment. Is there any technological way to even tell whether other countries are cheating? Well, so there, there, there are two different, there are really two fundamentally different questions there. One is on cheating at the country level, then there's a whole other issue, which is that the monitoring and enforcement is gonna be at the national level. But there's the, what I really started with, with your question, is the issue of emissions leakage, which of course to politicians is very, which is what that's called, what you just described. And now to politicians, they don't care about emissions leakage uh, unless they're very green. They care about what goes along with it, which is the leakage of jobs, right? So that's, that, and so it's a very big political issue. Now it turns out it's an issue for a few industries, you know, cement, Portland cement production would be the poster child here because of the great energy intensity, uh, both for the process admissions and also for the production. So there are certain areas where this is a big uh, uh, factor. But in fact, analysis that's been done, such as in the European Union, where uh, a cement producing plant is going to be in competition with plants that are in uh, Algeria, where they don't have the targets they have in Europe. And then the question comes up, um, so are, are the, is the French company going to locate its next facility in Algeria? And that's equivalent to what you're describing. So it turns out the empirical analysis is, seriously, is that it's a trivial effect. It is lost in the noise. The noise is due to the fact that the differences in labor costs so swamp all of these relatively minor differences in costs of production due to environmental um, policies. That said, there are mechanisms to address this. Now, the obvious one uh, is, is a border adjustment mechanism, and the Europeans want to put one on the United States. We'll see where that goes, depending on, on future politics uh, in this country. There's also an approach that the Obama administration used with its cap and trade system. It has an unfortunate 
uh, name, an output-based updating allocation mechanism. What it means is if you had larger production last year of widgets, you get more allowances to emit the given pollutant. What that does, that's a subsidy that's on the margin. It's not infra marginal, it's marginal and it affects competitiveness. Now, of course it introduces like any subsidy inefficiencies, but it's a way in which economies have sought to address this. And I can tell you like my discussions in Beijing where we're working on the design of their called a tradable performance standard, slightly different. This is a huge issue for them as you could imagine. And this is the sort of thing they're looking at. So uh, let, me, let me summarize a couple of the questions. A number of the questions uh, that people have asked uh, have deal with communication, an area in which uh, you've made significant contributions. So there are two parts to the way of thinking about it. I'll, I'll phrase the overall communication question. One communication question is, what if anything, is it possible to say to those who deny the possibility of climate change, symmetrically, what if anything can we say to those who say that the challenge of climate change requires that we all return to a pre-industrial society? Uh, that's one way of doing it. A more focused way of asking this question is uh, the IPCC is going to produce the sixth annual assessment report uh, how, how successful do you think the, the IPCC has been in its past five reports and how successful is it likely to be on the, on the sixth? So, you know, we, we already know and we now have demonstration from the pandemic that one way we can effectively reduce CO2 emissions is by putting in place a global recession. But obviously that's not a desirable approach. So CO2 emissions have fallen for obvious reasons. In, in all parts uh, of the world um, during this terrible recession brought about by responses to the pandemic. So then the question becomes, are there ways that we can minimize what the impacts are on costs? And that takes us back to those cost-effective um, policies. So it's, it's certainly not the case that one needs to go back to the Stone Age. Um, a very aggressive climate policy in the US, very aggressive would represent a cost of perhaps 1% uh, of GDP. 1% of G, that's a big number. 1% of GDP is what is spent by EPA, not the other department, just EPA on all other environmental pollutants. So it'd be doubling it. Now, does that, does that mean you know, sending us into uh, depression? No, but what it do, does it mean that the rate of economic growth on an annual basis would be less than it otherwise is putting aside the economic benefits of reducing the risk of climate change, productivity impacts. Yes, and those are, uh, those are the, to, me, to my mind, those are the trade-offs. But they don't, those trade-offs from all of the analysis that I've either participated in or read, they don't justify a lack of action. To people who are, you know, the climate skeptics, um, it's important to recognize that we're, we're almost unique in the United States. This is not an issue that comes up. So I spent a huge amount of time in other countries um, and nowhere does one hear it uh, like one does here. So yes, there are minor little pockets on the internet everywhere, but here it's been a fundamental part of, uh, of one of the political parties to some degree for a while. I think that's now fading, but this is relatively unique. The US is a unique country, alas. Well, by the way, I think it's interesting to point out that the, the uh, uh, George H.W. Administra Bush administration, which was a Republican administration, played a central role in setting up the sulfur dioxide markets. So it is a little bit puzzling what has happened. Uh, let me ask um, one- Can I just question? jump in and say, just to emphasize what you said, it, it's important for people to keep it in mind because nowadays, you know, Democrats, good guys, Republicans, bad guys on environment and climate change. And it's true, we've had this dramatic uh, political polarization and things have sorted out. But if you go back, not very many years, at least by my age, if you go back a couple of decades, this was a bipartisan issue. It was a regional issue geographically, but it was bipartisan. So not only w was it the George H.W. Bush White House, with which I worked closely on the design of that, emissions trading program. Not only did they do that, but the first significant emissions trading program was the Let It Gasoline phase down. 
a decade earlier. That was in the Reagan administration. It was a tradable performance standard, standard among refineries. That's how we got the lead out of gasoline. Um, and that was the, you know, people think of as the arch conservative uh, Reagan administration. So times have changed. Okay, a more uh, direct question. What do you think it would be an appropriate level of the carbon tax now and how rapidly should it grow? Uh, if, I, if I were to rep, rep, uh, rep, uh, represent the social cost of, of greenhouse gas emissions by a single number for today, what would be the corresponding carbon tax in your assessment? So when you said the appropriate number, it would depend upon if what you, one, if my answer is to be in terms of what would be the theoretically correct number that would bring about the efficient amount in economic terms, uh, if implemented, or if by appropriate, you mean conditional upon implementation and what the likelihood is of such a tax being implemented, what's the appropriate one? So the second question is easy to answer because we don't have to make political judgments. And the social cost of carbon as estimated um, by the Obama administration, and now it's being updated by resources for the future cl collaboratively with several universities. Um, that was estimated, it's probably now at about $50 per ton uh, for emissions in uh, the year 2030, about $50 per ton. That's representing the present discounted value 100 years out back to 2030 of the damages. But if you were asked the question instead, what kind of carbon tax should we start with, thinking about the politics as well as everything else, my answer would be get the structure right. If it's going to be a carbon tax, get the structure right, provide in it political incentives so that even though it's not first best, like reducing distortionary taxes, because that lowers the social cost, you know, maybe it's sending checks to everyone with their congressman's return address that makes it more feasible, and then put in place a trajectory of it increasing over time. So let me follow that question up. The state of Washington has a successive, uh, the people of the state of Washington uh, defeated two referenda, right. one, both of which were intended to put a, low, a, a price on, on carbon. Um, and revenues were supposed to be used uh, in various ways, pretty decisively. Uh, President Macron in France tried to increase the gas tax and uh, middle class Frenchmen uh, said, not when we've got yellow jackets, you don't. Uh, so one question is, do you think that these defeats reflect an essential aspect which you emphasize in your presentation, which is that this is a global problem and local incentives to, to address this problem locally necessarily are weak. And so that, was that what the problem was or was it in some sense um, uh, reflecting perhaps more skepticism about the severity of climate change. What's your assessment well, of why the public would not like it? I think it's all of the above plus a few others. If this was 15 years ago, then I would say, yes, people are unwilling. There's not a lot of acceptance to pay a carbon tax and use instead a cap and trade mechanism because a cap and trade mechanism does a better job of sweeping under the rug the cost, essentially. It's not as obvious. But that's, that, that political advantage of cap and trade, in my opinion, um, no longer exists as a result of the debates that took place in the Congress over the Waxman-Markey legislation when conservative Republicans and coal state Democrats successfully demonized cap and trade as cap and tax. And whenever they use that phrase cap and tax, I bridled a little bit because I wanted the legislation to go forward. But I also recognized, well, they were right because the auction, the, the allowances were going to be auctioned. So it really was like a tax. I think the answer probably is uh, second best policies in, in the short term. Um, I was in a meeting uh, very recently with Lisa Murkowski, who at least, uh, at least until January 5th uh, is uh, chair of the energy committee in the, in the Senate. And um, I heard openness to uh, carbon pricing if part of a larger package at a relatively low number, and then what do you do with the revenue? I want, I want the revenue to go back to my constituents. So I think that there are possibilities there. Another would be if, you know, if the Congress decided to face up to budgetary deficits of the 
order we have now. We're only looking for sources of revenue. Well, one possibility would be a consumption tax, low hanging fruit, an energy tax. And now we're you know, a step away from a carbon tax. So I think there are possibilities, but I agree with the premise of your question. Politically, as I said at the outset, it's extremely difficult. Okay, let me, um, this is sort of a question uh, related to that, which is, um, there are other kinds of, uh, of technologies, one thinks of nuclear fission or fusion on the one si side, perhaps geoengineering on the other side and mm -hmm. so on. What sort of a role can either alternative sources of, of energy uh, other than the usual solar and wind can play, in ro play a role and direct technological attempts to limit uh, the effects of greenhouse gases? How, how does that play in your judgment in terms so of wise policy? The nature of this problem and the political challenges to addressing it and the terrible consequences if it's not addressed justify, again, to use that cliche in all of the above uh, approach. So um, nuclear power, if it were uh, politically feasible, it's questionable whether it is in this country at, at new locations anyway, at new sites, that ought to be part of the story. Um, along, with, along with renewables and good climate policies, a cap and trade or a carbon tax would provide incentives for nuclear power, the same as they would for uh, renewables, but also for large scale hydro and small scale uh, hydro. Um, geoengineering is certainly justified in terms of research. And I think that's the way a lot of both the scientific and engineering communities who are working on it, as well as the few economists such as Scott Barrett at Columbia and a few others who have really examined the economics would say that we ought to be carrying out research. It turns out it presents very interesting problems of governance. Uh, I won't take time to talk about them. They're the opposite of the global commons problem. Instead of a free rider issue, it is to use the phrase of Marty Weitzman, a free driver issue. Um, and so there are other issues, but also adaptation because even if we re, you know, stop all climate, uh, I mean, greenhouse gases tomorrow morning, there's gonna be climate change. So adaptation is an important part of the story. And unfortunately, various interest groups historically and even today will block out some of the options on somewhat of an ideological uh, basis. I don't mean to disparage them by ideological, but it's not clear that it's scientific or economic. And I think that that's misguided. Okay, so um, we're sort of coming to the end and normally in these kinds of uh, uh, situations, um, I like people who end on an optimistic note, but, but um, I leave it up, up to you. Given sort of uh, the political developments we've seen, given also the international developments, in particular, the seriousness with which uh, leaders in countries like China or India Europe seem to take this kind of problem. Um, what is your sense about the hope for uh, a rejuvenation of the Paris Accords, a more serious focus on implementation, uh, on, as Chris emphasized, on enforcement and so on, both say over the next five years and also perhaps over the next 20, 25 years. What's, what's your sense about how all this is gonna play out? So based upon everything we've talked about and really focusing on an economic perspective and a technocratic perspective, it would be easy to be very pessimistic about the future because uh, you know, of the realities, the intertemporal nature, the intertemporal asymmetry, as well as the global commons nature of the problem. I derive one, what I think is an extremely important source of optimism about the future. Uh, and that is young people, both in Europe and the United States and in other parts of the world who have over the past 24 to 36 months uh, risen up with this new movement of youth activism on climate change. I don't always agree with uh, many of the things that they say 
but it's extremely encouraging. The question is, is the large degree to which youth take climate change much more seriously on average than people of a generation older, let alone of my generation. The question, of course, is whether that's a function of age or of cohort. You know, as they become older, will they become more conservative, as many people do? I believe there's a fundamental changes. And um, when my kids went through primary school, they were, you know, someone from the right would say they were indoctrinated to start being concerned about climate change. That didn't happen probably to the classes five years before theirs. So that's my source of optimism. It's the youth of the world. Great. On that, on that cheery note, uh, thank you very much, Rob Stevens, that for what I think is, it has been a wonderful talk. Uh, I tried my best to channel the disparate questions of the, of the audience uh, into a small number. I hope I didn't do a, a huge injustice. Uh, but thank you again very much. And thank you to everybody in the audience uh, uh, for attending. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. And always remember, economists are your only hope for productive, sensible social policy uh, in the future. We are indispensable uh, to the world. That's what we keep telling ourselves. Thank you very much again, Rob. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you.